So uh, just to, in the interest of time, I'll introduce our next speaker, Jake's, uh, Jake Vogel, who's connecting from across the ponds. Uh, and he's going to be giving us, I think, uh, quite um, a uh, far reaching talk on subtyping and mechanisms and some um, new work as well, I believe, Jake. Yeah, so here I'll just share my. Uh, Sorry, we can't hear you quite yet. We're just gonna... Oh. I think turn the speakers back up. Right. We'll probably have to mute ourselves here and then turn the speakers up. So let's try that. Uh, can you hear me? Test, test. Still can't hear you. No, huh? Oh, hang on. I know what's going on. I'm not sure if you guys are talking. I can't. I can't hear anything at this point. Jake. Jake. Yeah, uh, I just heard that, but I can't. I can't hear anything. Anything else? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll just assume everyone can hear me and everything is okay. Everything is okay. And I'll just start uh, presenting. Um, tell me if that's not the case and I'll stop. Um, so yeah, so uh, hopefully you guys can hear me and I'm not just talking to nobody. Um, I wanted to first uh, thank um, Pete and, and Neil and Alex for putting this, putting this on. Uh, this is a really awesome talk. The roster is like stacked. I feel very privileged to be a part of it, and um, and also very thankful that you've all stayed to the bitter end. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, connectome-based disease progression models. So otherwise, models that assume that the disease is, is progressing through the the brain's intrinsic communication pathways. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of, of overlap um, with with the really just fantastic talk that you saw Dr. Gabarino give. Um, uh, about an hour ago, um, but I think it will be mostly complimentary. And this is based on a review actually uh, that I've just finished writing with uh, the wonderful folks you see on this slide. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it, so it's gonna reflect kind of the views of, of us uh, and we're you know, some modelers, some actual neurologists and a lot of people in between. So I think in that, in that respect, it'll be fairly complimentary to what you've heard before. Uh, the focus will mostly be on connectome-based models and sort of um, where we've been and, and where we're going uh, or where we might be going. So uh, just to outline sort of what that content's going to be, I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the history of these network spread models. Um, I'm gonna talk about how networks actually contribute to the disease progression. And I'm gonna uh, talk end by speaking about how we can potentially Im improve these models um, going forward. So I'll start with a, a sort of brief history. This might be a review for a lot of you, so I'll, I'll sort of zoom through it, but Obviously, you know, our jobs would not be very interesting if there was an easy one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between patholo pathology and clinical syndromes. Um, that's obviously not the case. Um, things are fairly complicated, but at least we do have something we can hang our hats on, which is the fact that most of these pathologies uh, do seem to have a, a sort of stereotyped path through the brain where they start ra rather focally in one area and then they sort of travel through the brain um, in a fairly specific path. And that can give us a lot of information, not only about sort of how the pathology leads to the clinical syndrome, um, but also sort of um, why, why that's happening. And I think as, as with many of you, I'm very interested in this idea of why the disease starts so focally, where it goes, and how we can model that, um, because that gives us an advantage um, and a lot of utilities that I'll go through a little bit later. Um, but obviously, one of the central hypotheses behind this is that um, the that the diseases, various diseases, are traveling through the brain's intrinsic communication pathways. And I, I always like to bring this up that the the first mention of this hypothesis that I know of this goes way back to 1985. There's this paper in PNAS where the authors write these data support the suggestion that pathological changes in AD affect regions that are interconnected by well-defined groups of connections that the disease process may extend along the connecting fiber. So this idea was around among pathologists in the 80s, but uh, speaking certainly for myself and maybe many of you, 
it really came to prominence for me in uh, this really wonderful seminal paper by Bill Seeley and colleagues in Neuron 2009. I think you all know it very well. Dr. Garbarino spoke about it, but um, you have uh, basically atrophy patterns measured from various neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, Seeley found that uh, those atrophy patterns actually overlapped very well with intrinsic functional and structural connectivity networks measured in healthy controls. And so that, that, that paper really um, made this field kind of explode and, and did a lot of important things. First of all, I, I mentioned that this fact that the sort of the relationship between pathology and clinical syndrome is really convoluted. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, there are obviously one pathology can lead to di different phenotypes. Uh, one phenotype can be caused by multiple pathologies, but now we sort of get this sort of intermediate layer, not just of brain regions that are involved, but actually brain regions that do something in the in the healthy brain, brain networks in, in, in particular. So uh, this also is great for us because it gives us as neuroimagers a seat at the table uh, in many ways because um, the brain, uh, sort of macro scale brain networks pretty uniquely can be measured um, by, by uh, neuroimaging. So that's helpful for us. What, what this paper also really did is it, it brought to prominence among neuroimagers this idea that networks themselves could be conduits of disease spread. And I'll sort of go through this hypothesis in a little bit more detail uh, later on. But uh, it, really, it really did stimulate several other papers that um, tried to sort of replicate or copycat um, the findings that uh, Celia and colleagues did and tried to understand how the brain's connectome um, influenced disease spread. And so, you know, some of these early papers just looked at spatial overlap, like the Sealy paper. This became much more useful when we had pet tracers, specifically for amyloid and tau and Alzheimer's disease, where we could just look at the spatial overlap between the pathological distribution and connectivity networks. Here's, for example, a nice paper from Sebastian Pomkvist and colleagues, where they found that the earliest areas of A beta deposition uh, were spatially overlapping with the default mode network. Um, but this uh, really quickly evolved already in 2012 to these sort of graph-based correlational models uh, that you ha heard Dr. Garbarino speak about earlier. Uh, this is kind of review for all of you, I I'm sure, but in case there are some beginners in the audience, we have sort of regions that are sort of nodes of this network. We have connections between those regions, maybe through functional connectivity or diffusion tractography. Uh, and then we can measure pathology within those regions, perhaps as um, uh, pet imaging or a, as, as a brain atrophy. Um, and so what we can do with this graph, there's so many different things that we've seen happen with this graph. A very common thing to do is measure distance of a node to the epicenter and correlate the distance of a node to the epicenter with the amount of pathology that that node uh, uh, basically has when you measure it with imaging. And there's tons of papers that have done this. Um, here's just one example, a really nice paper came out recently in Nature Communications by Nico Franzmeier, just focusing on the sort of leftmost plots here. Each dot is a region. On the x-axis, you have uh, connectivity to a, to a tau epicenter. On the y-axis, you have tau pathology measured with tau pet. And you can see a pretty strong correlation here in both in two types of 4R tauopathies. And there's been a lot of other papers that have sort of used this correlational approach to show a relationship between brain networks and pathology. Um, but this has sort of evolved, uh, to be fair, this also started in 2012, but it evolved into these connectome-based diffusion models, which again, you just heard a lot about from Dr. Garbarino. Um, and in a, the, the, you've got the same idea. You have a sort of brain graph that's built using actual measurable um, elements, and you can simulate the diffusion of uh, a signal from, for example, an epicenter through the rest of the brain, and you can compare the simulated to the observed patterns. And I guess what's really nice about this is because you have this pseudo-time aspect, um, you're sort of able to uh, capture some of these secondary and tertiary uh, spreading events. Um, it gives you a lot more information than these correlational approaches. And uh, we did this in Nature Communications in 2020. Again, each dot is a region, a region of interest. X is predicted um, sort of tau pathology and Y was, is the observed tau pathology. And you can see a pretty strong connection, again, implicating uh, brain networks as um, sort of the field through which uh, tau pathology appears to diffuse. What was also cool about this is that we, we simulated with several different types of epicenters, and we found the enteronal cortex to be the best epicenter, uh, which was great because it really corresponds with the autopsy literature showing that this is the most likely sort of nucleus of, of tau uh, spread, um, or, or epicenter, I should say. Um, so obviously, this is not the only model. I'm so grateful for, to Dr. Garbarino for going through all these because she did it a million times better than I could. Um, this is just to sort of, sort of um, you know, point out that there are many types of these uh, diffusion models, um, including this sort of ne um, network diffusion model from 2012, Ashish Raj, 
um, and some of these other sort of reaction diffusion models, uh, Dr. Gabarino's work as well. Uh, one that, that was not discussed is this SIR model uh, that has been um, popular recently. This stands for Susceptible Infected Recovery uh, Model that uh, came from the epidemiology literature. And it's very cool because uh, you can measure a node as infected with a pathology and then quote unquote recovered, which in this case really means atrophied. Um, so there's been some cool um, uses of that model as well. But this is in, in many ways the state of the art of where we are now. Um, in sort of um, modeling the relationship between networks and, and pathology. And so the real, the real takeaway from all this is that there is a strong evidence that the connectome is a, a good roadmap for disease spread and something that we can base our, our sort of simulation and disease progression models on top of. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit more about how networks contribute to disease progression. Uh, it's not that relevant, actually, I think, when it comes to modeling. It might be, uh, but I think it's good to know since this is sort of our field of study. Um, obviously, to come back to this central hypothesis is this idea that networks are conduits of disease spread, that actually the, uh, ne um, uh, networks are very passive and they're si simply the communication architecture of the brain and the pathology is like cars driving along a highway, um, using that to, to get you know, down an axon into, a, post, into a, a synapse, across a synapse, and into a postsynaptic neuron. And so if you zoom out, uh, a region that uh, can, we can predict a region to have pathology based on uh, how connected it is to other regions that already have pathology. Um, and so it should be stated that through animal models, and this is very nicely reviewed by this paper in, uh, by Pang and colleagues, um, have, they've, they've basically shown that um, every aspect of this process of disease spread has shown to be biologically feasible. Um, that doesn't mean that we know that this happens. In fact, it, it, we've never actually imaged or, or seen a you know, pathological element traveling down an axon, landing at another neuron, and then starting an, a sort of aggregation process. Um, so we don't know it for sure. And because of that, it's, it's important to kind of consider other possibilities um, and how networks are actually influencing what's going on. And this one idea is that networks themselves may, might participate in, in driving the disease progression. And uh, this idea was, um, it's been around for a while, but I think it was nicely summarized in this Busha and Hyman uh, review here. And I think one of the main elements that's important to know here is that at the cellular level, uh, the presence of amyloid seems to facilitate this uh, hyperactivity of neurons that are nearby. And this causes sort of a hyperconnectivity of neuronal networks in those areas. And this is very important to know because there's also been a lot of literature that's shown that um, uh, stimulated neurons will actually secrete uh, beta amyloid and tau. And it's interesting also because tau itself seems to be a neuronal silencer. So there seems to be these sort of dynamics uh, where um, uh, the, the pathologies themselves influence things that happen, like network circuitry in many ways. And this sort of creates this idea of a, a vicious cycle where a pathology stimulates, you know, a, a neuron at the synapse. This depolarizes the neuron and causes more production of pathology. And then the process then repeats. And this is actually, there's some evidence for this even in, in humans as well uh, from neuroimaging studies. This is a pretty old one, but it's, it's, it's a good one. Um, this is where uh, individuals were measured at baseline and then two years later, and people who are MCI and converted to Alzheimer's disease, uh, they showed um, um, an increased hippocampal signal at baseline during a task. Um, and this, this it's, it's a very small sample, but actually this has been replicated maybe, maybe uh, five or six or seven times by different labs. Um, and there's a nice paper uh, from the Jagus lab from a couple of years back showing that the degree of hippocampal activation during a task at baseline is actually directly correlated with the amount of amyloid accumulation in the same people. Um, and they went on to show that, that the, the, the amyloid accumulation mediates this relationship by, between hippocampal activation at baseline and decline in cognition. And so this, this, the, the idea is that the, the pathology is, is probably causing the hyperconnectivity or the hyperactivation and also being sort of um, caused by it in, in a sort of vicious cycle. And this has led to this, this idea of networks as drivers, um, where again, you have you know, stimulation of a neuron uh, by, by a pathology that, that uh, creates a postsynaptic pathology at the next synapse uh, down, down the line. And then this creates a situation where those neurons are hyperactive and creating their own amount of pathology. Meanwhile, the neurons are then dying. The tau is silencing what's going on. It's very complicated, but uh, it, it does implicate networks themselves as a means of uh, progressing the disease along. Um, and there's some really interesting work by uh, David Jones from the Mayo and a lot of other people who have who've sort of started to be, become interested in this phenomenon. We also have to consider the idea that networks themselves, and specifically talking about the commu uh, communication pathways, as totally irrelevant um, and just kind of spatial uh, 
spatially uh, expressed epiphenomena. And we know that uh, the, uh, sort of cell populations that are um, functionally or anatomically connected, they also development, they also develop in synchrony. Uh, they share gene expression, uh, they have similar patterns of gene expression, and they have similar, similar physiology. And it's very possible that these elements actually are what's driving the sort of um, selective vulnerability of these regions and not the fact that they're talking to each other. So we can just uh, imagine a, a toy example here where you have gradients of, of sort of types of tissue across the cortex, uh, some of which is uh, resistant to pathology, some of which is vulnerable to pathology. And if you kind of superimpose a, a, a graph on that, um, on this kind of like fake cortex here, and you you see this this uh, pathology, you can say, oh well, there's a relationship between pathology and connect and, and connection to this epicenter region. But the truth is that in this toy example is that the pathology is actually being um, uh, appearing in regions that are sort of far away from this resistant node. This gets even more complicated when we know that there's a relationship between vulnerability of tissue, or I should say, um, kind of similarity of tissue, and um, yeah, the network architecture. So it's, it's incredibly hard to really disentangle uh, these elements, and we have to sort of understand this is a possibility, um, that, that, that the, uh, there's not actually an agent-based spread going on. Um, so the takeaway is that we don't really know how networks influence disease spread yet, and it might actually not really be soluble using neuroimaging. Maybe it will be. Um, but I, th I think the, the sort of good news is that it might not actually be that relevant for disease progression models, um, which is like, why did I talk about it? But I, I just think it's, it's interesting to consider. Um, so the last part of the talk, I'm going to, to speak a little bit about how um, the existing sort of network-based sort of uh, simulations or disease progression models can be improved. Um, so in order to do that, we first have to ask ourselves, what do we want out of these connectome-based models? Um, obviously, the, the first step was just uh, increasing evidence from animal models and so forth that uh, networks play a role in the spread of neurodegenerative disease. And I think we've done that about as well as we can. They do seem like reliable um, features to use as bases of, of the spread of disease. Uh, but I think what we really want to get to is to be able to make individual level predictions, um, forecast outcomes that might be relevant for clinical trials and resolve inter-individual uh, heterogeneity. And also, you know, along the way, I, I think what we'd really like is to, to gain some neurobiological insight uh, to, to start to understand macro scale or even micro scale disease mechanisms that and maybe even discover some potential treatment targets. And um, so uh, we put our heads together, uh, myself and the people that have been writing this review and sort of come up with a few axes by which we can imagine next generation models um, sort of improving and, and some of which we've already started to see. This is a very busy figure, so I'll walk you through it a uh, um, little piece by piece. But uh, the first is this idea of modulating factors. I think uh, Dr. Garverino gave a really great overview of what those things might be. Uh, but we can just take, for example, if we know that there's an important gene to a disease being expressed more or less at a certain node, we can let that the expression of that information influence the production or the clearance or the reception of um, pathology. And you can do the same thing with like certain uh, edges uh, being more or less myelinated or something like that. And we've already actually begun to see the, uh, this influence on um, uh, connectome-based diffusion models. Uh, one of my favorites is this paper by uh, Ying, Chu, uh, Ying Qiu Zheng and, and colleagues in PLOS Biology, uh, where they were interested in using the SIR model to predict uh, atrophy in Parkinson's disease. And they, they looked at the regional expression of two genes relevant to Parkinson's disease and uh, let those affect the production and clearance respectively um, at, at the nodal level. And when they did this, when they added these features, if you look at the red lines above, you can see that um, the model fit actually improved over adding sort of noise, uh, which is really interesting in showing that you can, you can really improve the models just by adding some kind of uh, population level gene expression information. The same thing has been now done in this really wonderful paper by Golia Shafier in uh, Brain, which I recommend everyone reads. Uh, they just did the same thing in FTD looking at FDD-relevant genes and, and found more or less the same results, um, some, some really nice papers. We could also talk about um, improving the temporal uh, or dynamic variability of co uh, connectome information. And so this might be at the level of just the connectome. We talked about earlier how pathology itself can influence network circuitry, at least at the functional level. We can also um, imagine situations where um, through the process of neurodegeneration, axons can be destroyed, connections can be severed. And this is probably relevant to our modeling of disease spread. And so it, it would be great if we can actually uh, let the, the graph itself change dynamically with the spreading of the disease. 
Um, but another way that, that we also already heard Dr. Garbarino talk about a little bit is this idea of um, modeling uh, copathology um, basically side by side. We know with amyloid uh, and tau and Alzheimer's disease, sort of tau starts in one area and seems to get accelerated into regions that uh, have amyloid. And so, um, you know, this paper from uh, 2020, uh, 2020 that we did, where we did a um, ESM and tried to predict tau uh, accumulation, we found that regions that are here in green at the top brains uh, were regions that were underestimated by the model. So they had less pathology. Uh, we expect uh, the model predicted there was less pathology than there actually was. And those regions all uh, seemed to have more amyloid in, in them. And there was actually a correlation between the model residuals and the level of amyloid at the sort of nodal level. And so what we really need to do is actually integrate this information into a, um, a diffusion model. Uh, I think we sort of, uh, we, we, there's some early uh, movement in this area. This is a nice paper by Misich and colleagues that just shows uh, it's possible to sort of um, simultaneously model um, the expression of two different pathologies. Um, there's also some cool papers uh, by Travis Thompson and, and also by Lee and colleagues in Neuron from the Sealy Lab that have also begun uh, moving in this direction that are worth a read. Uh, and finally, there's the idea of uh, being able to model individual variability to resolve some of this discrepancy um, in disease progression. Um, there's so many ways that we can do this. Uh, you know, we know from fingerprinting studies that there's individual um, uh, that everyone has a sort of different network architecture, so we can sort of use that in, in modeling uh, pathology at the level of individual. We can all the things I've already talked about can can be resolved at the individual level if you have certain measures, maybe CSF or genotype information. And uh, I want to just really quickly talk about the idea of individualized epicenters. Um, uh, we had this paper recently where we uh, used sustain with a bunch of the members here uh, at this at this meeting to look at uh, subtypes of tau progression. And uh, we fit the epidemic spreading model to uh, uh, um, a, a sort of a posteriori to each of these different subtypes. And we found an enterinal epicenter worked uh, you know, decently well. But when we used uh, a, a different epicenter for each subtype, we found it actually improved the model fit, which maybe suggests that, um, the, <clears throat> that, that the pathology is traveling through different networks for different people. Um, and there's some other really great um, studies that have looked into this as well. Here's one by Nico Franzmeier and colleagues uh, where, and I like this one in particular because they sort of move it into having some sort of clinical validity. Um, this is a busy slide, but what they do is they, they find regions of interest um, that are individual specific, and they're based on the regions that are most connected to regions that already have pathology. And those individual specific regions are represented by these boxes all the way on the left. And you can see that the longitudinal accumulation of tau in those regions is actually higher than it is in these standard group level regions, which represent the other seven or so boxes. Um, so maybe useful for clinical trials. So uh, the last thing I'll say is that we could probably advance these models without actually doing any work just by waiting for um, other improvements in neuroimaging, obviously having pet tracers for other pathologies uh, that, that I hear are some kind of around the corner, um, obviously improving the fidelity and resolution of, of some of our imaging information, being able to better represent subcortical structures, which seem to be very involved in most of these pathologies, um, and to be able to integrate more animal data, longitudinal data, and just more data in general. And in, in that way, we got to be supportive of open science practices. And my last slide, what I'll leave you with are some caveats and conclusions. Um, some things that to just think about well, as we are, you know, as a group kind of developing these models, um, null and alternative hypothesis testing is critical. There's so many great softwares now for making sort of, um, you know, scrambling brain graphs, but preserving certain features or making spatially aware um, null uh, distributions from a particular uh, neuroimaging uh, feature. And we should also, you know, explore other hypotheses. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, connectivity at the, the, that's, there are other types of brain networks, right? Metabolic connectivity, gene expression connectivity, and so forth that we can use. I think probably the most important, important here is to enforce parsimony and interpretability. Um, it's, it's very easy to over-parameterize and, and maybe get better models, but I don't think there's a good reason to have a parameter that isn't directly tied to a biological measurable phenomenon that we can uh, measure either across a population or, um, or, or within an individual. So we want to try to keep things as uh, straightforward as we can. And the reason for this is that we want to sort of keep our target in mind, which is, you know, learning something about the biology or getting some kind of clinical utility out of this rather than just modeling for modeling's sake, even though it's so fun to do. Um, you know, obviously knowing the limitations of what we can and can't do and focusing on what we can do. And in terms of future directions, I think way down the line, it would be very nice to be able to model cognitive outcomes, essentially to you know, model what's happening at the level of disease and then 
uh, sort of be able to predict how that will uh, influence the behavior of a participant uh, down the line and over time, and hopefully uh, be able to have some ecologically valid testing and opera opera operationalization. Uh, with that, thank you so much for your attention. Sorry, maybe I run a couple minutes uh, over time, but I want to give a big thank you to co-authors that are spread all across these different institutions, um, and uh, particularly Nico, uh, Michael, uh, Nick, and uh, Joanna, who were all um, kind of uh, critical to coming up with all these ideas and making the figures. So this represents kind of a collective of all of our ideas. Uh, so thanks. Thanks, Jake. Um, and thank you, Ralph, Wade, for a uh, very comprehensive talk. Um, so, I think we have time for, again, just a single burning question from the audience. Okay. You have one from Sarah that she says is in burning. No, it is in, it is in, it is in burning. Uh, so, if anyone else. No, okay, yeah, I was just um, wondering about, so thanks, uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, so I was wondering, um, so at the end, you mentioned um, about the risks of over-parameterization and the need for, you know, keeping, uh, and also for like, hypothesis testing somehow. So trying to, yeah, uh, like find a framework for testing alternative hypotheses and so on. So my, my, my view on this is that yeah, we actually still um, um, so we need a you know a framework for this. You can't hear it, Jake. No, I, I could hear before and now I can't hear as well. Okay, yeah. Sorry, the microphone. So we need a proper, you know, model selection framework for this, I think. Because of course we could, you know, try Thing, uh, uh, or you know, try to just use different models with fewer parameters, but without a, a formal, you know, framework for proper model selection. For proper model selection, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's. Uh, I think it's, it's something. I don't know what what's your what's your thought on this. If you think that could be a possible way to go for testing these different types of models against each other. Because, you know, also in the community, there are different models that have been developed. You know, the SEER model, the uh, Kolmogorov equation, the population balance equation. But if, if we don't have a common framework with which we can test these model ones against the other, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, I think it's an important point. What do you think? Yeah, no, it's a fantastic point. I think that up, up to this point, it's basically been about uh, just having a hypothesis and testing that and hoping it works. Like a lot of these uh, studies that have incorporated gene expression have basically taken like the top, you know, disease related genes and threw them in and said, does this improve the model? And in, in, that, in that regard, I think it's a great way of building some evidence and testing a hypothesis. Um, you know, we know something's related to a disease you know, if we add this element, does it improve our, our progression models that, you know, but that's, that's very limited, right? Because it doesn't really let you explore or come up with other insights. So I, I think that, um, you know, having some kind of quantitative way of comparing a model and saying this is an improvement uh, would be fantastic. Um, although, although tricky uh, in many ways, um, whether it's just sort of like building off of one common framework where, where things are, are kind of comparable between, between studies from different groups might be one way to go about it. Um, but the other kind of obvious way is, is to have some sort of validation. And I don't necessarily mean that, well, obviously longitudinal data, it w would be a nice way to validate what's going on. Um, but the other way would be to sort of like, you know, go back and test certain relationships you, one might find, um, in, a, you know, in a, in a cell or, or in a, in a, um, in vivo model. There are actually have been some interesting applications of, uh, these diffusion based models in animals. So there's, um, there was the Henderson paper in 2019 in Nature Neuroscience. There is a paper by Kornblath and colleagues that looked at tau in 2021, and more recently, this paper by Rahael and colleagues this year in Brain, all of which used either the SIR model or the NDM model in animals, um, using sort of like mass brain connectivity uh, um, data and actually injected pathology. Um, and so that's that's maybe a, a nice place to to sort of move into the realm of 
of validating hypotheses. But to go back to your original point about having some empirical way of, of, of you know, comparing models and, and saying this is objectively an improvement, it's tricky. It's just sort of about comparing it to sort of, you know, spatial, spatially aware null distributions and that, that only gets you so far. So uh, great point though, and good thing to just discuss. We should have a challenge. You know, yeah, like, we should have right? thought about that. <laughs> we could think Definitely. about that. <laughs> cool. Thanks, right. thank you. Totally, totally. Thank you. Um, thanks again, Jade. Uh, thank Jade.